you get to 300? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, 8.4 page gets 1.25. Yeah. For the wavelength. Mm -hmm. 1 over 20 for a period. No, because you have to wait on the period and the period. You guys have voted or vote today. Because democracy is one of the things that, you know, is kind of our civic duty. Use it or lose it type. So, anyway, that's enough of that. <laughs> but uh, it's, it is important. So, I'd like to, we're covering waves today, but before I do finishing up the wave stuff, before I get into that though, um, does anyone have any more questions on the homework? They look like Okay. So 
would that mean that this plug in four plus <coughs> nine times the wavelength set that Easy. equal to two pi? That's for C. Uh, no, that's, that's, oh, that's for B, right? B. Yeah. C is frequency. So, frequency. what would I do for frequency, do you think? You would have to. Uh, Speed. The one over period. Well, if this changed by a period, if T changed by a period, I would change by, then the argument in here would go through once, would change by two pi, the thing would go through one cycle, right? So I could write 1260 times a period is going to be 2 pi. Okay. Solve for period. And I guess it's in seconds, probably, I guess. And so what's frequency? How is frequency and period related? 1 over period. That's right. Two. Okay. So you're multiplying it by t because so this is the period when because 1260t is basically just equal to t over the period. Well, if I, if I move by one period in time, that means the wave goes to one cycle. Uh -huh. That's the same thing as having the argument or what's inside this cosine changed by 2 pi. So I can say that if this goes one period, then it changed by 2 pi. How'd, how'd you get the 1260 again? It's given. It's, oh, yeah, it's given. Sorry. Well, not bad. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I have cosine of an angle, and the angle came by 2 pi, and then I get back up here, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, my angle is everything in here. Okay. Okay. So if I keep this thing constant, and I'm just changing time, then uh, if I move this, then if uh, theta um, goes to theta plus 2 pi in that time, then whatever I added to this time had to change this by 2 pi. Oh, 60. I guess you can do minus, it doesn't really matter, but we'll be having minus 1260 times t plus, or times the, the change in time is 2 pi. Um, so we would get the, um, we'd get rid of this minus sign because whether it's plus or minus 2 pi, you still came by one period. So, yeah, it makes sense. So we just look at how much this thing changes. I move over one wavelength in x, it changes by 2 pi. If I move one period in time, it changes by 2 pi. 360 degrees, 300 degrees. If we use the or not. Okay, what's the, it says how fast is this wave traveling? So how do we get how fast it travels? We can do this from units. Um, so, well, first of all, you can see that if you travel one wavelength in one period, you know, you have a distance and a time right there. So you can do lambda over a period of the speed, that's the same thing as lambda times frequency. So after you've solved for those two things, then you can get it. Wait, can't we just do lambda over? Oh, we can't just do lambda, or yeah, wavelength over frequency. No, wavelength over frequency won't give you the, the correct unit for meters per second. <coughs> wavelength, see, frequency is one over seconds. Mm -hmm. So if I want meters per second, I need to do the lambda time frequency. Is that, isn't t negative seconds? Per t is seconds? Yeah, it is. You could just do this. Isn't it m over s? Yeah, this is. Okay. 
wavelengths. Right? So we literally just take what we solved for yeah. wavelength and put it over to Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it says, what's the maximum transverse velocity of the wave? All right. So this one we've got to kind of think about a little bit. So transverse velocity, if I imagine, imagine I have this wave on this string. Transverse wave means the actual piece of the string is moving perpendicular to the direction the wave is traveling. So let's say the wave is traveling along this, this string, but the string is moving up and down every little piece of it. So if I look at it like this, then each little piece of the string would move in, uh, uh, to its positive amplitude down to its negative amplitude and back in one, in one second, or in one period, right? So it goes up and down and back. So the maximum transverse amplitude, let's see if we can see if we can look at that. So if I think of it as a little oscillator going back and forth, each little chunk is kind of undergoing simple harmonic oscillation, doesn't it? Well, it is. Each little chunk on this spring is going simple, is acting like a little simple harmonic oscillator. And if I were to look at this and graph it, well, you know, it goes up and down like this. Um, if I were to look at a, a point on a circle moving around with angular frequency and pi head frequency. This point, the, the, the y position of this point would look a lot like this, right? In fact, if this, would be, if this had a radius of the amplitude, um, the y position of this point on the end of the circle that's rotating would be identical, would look identical to the y position of this little piece of the spring, or the, the string. Now, if this is moving with an angular velocity of 2 pi frequency and has an amplitude of a, then the speed along here, which corresponds to the maximum speed of this, is you know, that corresponds to what is here, uh, the center point of the be a times 2 pi f, right? So radius times angular velocity is the, uh, is the speed of the point on the edge of the circle, and that point corresponds to the maximum speed of, uh, of this thing. Does that make any sense to you guys? So if you're interested in maximum speeds, Go to that little circle picture we have for simple harmonic motion. <coughs> so yeah, that's a good problem. I like that. So that's a, that would be the maximum speed. Then. Yeah, that would be the maximum speed. I'm putting the max. So see, see if you can make that argument on your own. You don't even look at it. Just pretend you never saw that think about it for a little bit. I don't know, it's, a, it's probably impossible to do. Right. You guys ready to do a, a little bit more wave stuff?
guitar type ideas. You end up getting what's called a beat frequency. So if I have two waves, different frequencies, so frequency F1 and F2, that I added together, the resultant added together wave has a, has a, a frequency F beat equal to F1 minus F2. Likewise, if you sample a wave at, that has a frequency F1 at a frequency F2, you appear that you get a, that, that, that you get like a beat frequency here that looks like a different frequency. Um, that's, it's hard to, it's really hard to picture this and go much further than just knowing that. Uh, we could try. Um, and that, uh, but pictures are kind of, I think, the, I think drawing a picture is the best way to do it. Um, so if I were, if you would, I'll just, Figure 8.7 in the book has a nice example of that, and you can see this beat frequency occur when you add together two waves of slightly different frequency. I would like to attempt to draw it, but I'm pretty sure it would be a disaster. It's a drawing waves of slightly different frequency would tell. So does that give you the beats per second? Does that give you yeah. Yeah, the beats per second that you would hear? Number of BTS, that's right. Okay. So that was just kind of something that we did sort of a little bit yesterday with the sampling of a wave at a different frequency using the um, using the strobe, the strobe light. You see if the strobe light was off a little bit, the wave looked like it was moving slower. That would have been the beat frequency between the strobe light and the spring light, the spring vibration. Right. There is something I wanted to cover in waves, and that's energy transported by waves and intensity. That stuff is kind of interesting. Um, if I imagine a wave is a bunch of harmonic oscillators that are kind of suspended. Each one of these harmonic oscillators treating it as a mass on a spring, each one of them has an, an energy, doesn't it? In fact, when they're when these masses are at rest at their max or at their maximum amplitude of the spring, the energy of each spring would be one half k times the maximum value squared. Maximum value from equilibrium squared. And this is the amplitude of the harmonic oscillator, and it's the same as the amplitude of the of the wave. Equals amplitude of wave. So each of these oscillators here has some energy. And any wave traveling through something that's acting like an oscillator will therefore have some energy as the wave goes through it. Um, actually adding up all the total energy in a wave would be equal to the number, total number of oscillators times the energy of each oscillator if they all have the same energy. And, um, you know, in principle, you could try and figure out what the total energy in the wave is by doing something like that. We're not really going to go too much into that. Um, what, we, what I want to do is look at energy transport instead, because that's something that we deal with all the time. What's N again? Total number of oscillators. Oh. Right? You, you have the energy for each oscillator. The total energy is just number of oscillators times energy for each oscillator. So the, the 
What's that? What is it? What's the relation? Is it subtractive, added? Of this? Yeah. Equals. No, between the N and the energy. Just multiply it. Okay. Yeah. Number of oscillators times the energy of each oscillator. <coughs> okay. So that's, uh, so that, that would be the energy of a wave. Now, there are a bunch of oscillators in a volume, right? So imagine I take this, a wave kind of travels through a volume in, in space. Let's say a sound wave. You treat each of the little molecules that it hits as some sort of oscillator around its, uh, e around its equilibrium position. All I'm trying to get at is, is that there's a certain number of oscillators per volume. Each oscillator has a given um, given energy. So I can introduce something called energy density in a way. And this is, what's a density? M over here. Yeah, and a density of almost anything, the mass per volume, is, a, is something per volume. So the normal density we deal with is a mass per volume. Right. So for instance, <coughs> anyone know the density of water? Off the top of your head? 1.0 yeah. grams. Grams per what? No. No. Yeah, that's, that, no. that's right. Grams per milliliter, right? What, what would that be in SI units? Okay, grams per cc, good. Cubic centimeter, milliliter, same yeah. thing. Um, what would it be in SI units? Kilograms per liter. Liter's not an SI unit yet, but it's a, um, but it's a, a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So, for instance, the density of mass, mass density. Take a mass, say, thousand kilograms. See what volume it would be in. So for water, that's a thousand kilograms every cubic meter. Okay, so a metric ton for a cubic meter of water. Mass over what? Volume. Mass over a volume. Oh, volume. Well. well, for something where I have a lot of oscillators, each of them having energy, I can treat the same, I can do exactly the same thing. I can take the total energy, whatever that is, and divide it by the volume. And this is what we call energy density in a wave. You know, total energy would be something like this. Um, yeah. Do all the separate um, springs, would they all have the same energy? Because they're that's all a very, they're okay, all I'm assuming they do. In, in reality, that's not the case. Okay. So we could put maybe average energy here. Okay. Okay. And that would be fine. Okay. Um, so energy density would be total energy over the volume, just like how mass density is mass divided by the volume. And I symbolize that with a little under case, lower case u. Okay, so energy density. Now, I just need to introduce that concept. I don't really care about what that U is or what I want to go further. But I would like to have that concept of energy density there. Imagine I'm looking at the wave, like a sound wave, for instance, traveling down a tube. Let's take the tube, something like this, okay? Inside the tube where the sound wave is, I'll have some sort of energy density. And uh, a wave travels with some speed, B. Okay. Let's say that the end of this tube has an area a. All right, in a time 
T every part all the wave at distance Vt from the end of the tube will leave this tube, right? So in a time Vt the wave tra travels Vt. In a time T the wave travels a distance Vt. Velocity times time, right? Mm -hmm. So it would move this distance. So in that time, all the energy stored in this region of the tube leaves the tube, right? Mm -hmm. The energy stored in here, all of that leaves the tube uh, in this region. In this region, all of the energy here goes leaves in a time t. Energy stored, E, would be equal to energy density times the volume in there, right? Energy density is U times the volume, right? If uh, U is energy per volume, energy, total energy would just be energy U times volume. The volume where the wave is that leaves the two is going to be this area cross-sectional area times that length. Volume of a cylinder is area times length. So I would get U A B T. Alright, now what did I want to do this for? I want to come up, this is what I wanted to have. This would be the energy transported per time by a wave across an area A. Well, I can introduce power transmitted. What's the relation between power and energy? So units of power is a watt. What's a watt? And joules is an energy, right? So what's the so just with using that unit as a clue? What's the uh, relation between energy transport and power? Rate inverse of per time. It's energy per time, right? Mm -hmm. Power is energy per time. But if I just look at this, my expression for the energy here. That would mean that that time goes away. So power would be energy density of the wave, area that it's being transmitted through V. Now there's something even more useful with the transmission of waves. This area is kind of, you know, kind of a little bit arbitrary, right? In some sense, like, you know, usually you don't have sound waves going through a well-defined tube. Uh, usually, you know, you're just looking at pretending that there's a little tube in air as the sound wave comes, and then in looking at the power through that little area. <coughs> so what we, oftentimes what we want is uh, something called power per area. That has a special name called intensity. <coughs> Symbolized with an I. What be the units of intensity? So if this is a watt. What's, what, what's the units of area? Enough. So so a meter would be a, an area like the length times the width of a square, right? Yeah. So a meter squared. Meter squared. Yeah. So this would be power per meter squared. Watts per meter. What, watts per meter? Watts per meter, meter squared. squared. Yeah, watts per meter squared. Okay. Um, and so that would be energy density times the Okay. Units of intensity. 
watts. Okay. Yeah, the intensity is kind of important. Um, let's kind of look at a few examples of this. Uh, if, okay, let's look at a 100 watt light bulb. This is producing light waves that come off the light bulb in all directions. And I'm treating these as like uh, the peaks on the waves. We're you know, traveling in these directions. Okay. So if I take a little 100 watt light bulb, put it in the middle of the room, light's coming from that in all directions and out of it in all directions. So, let's say I'm one meter from that light bulb. Let's see if we can figure out the intensity of light at one meter away. So imagine I have the light bulb there, there's light coming from it in all directions. Intensity is going to be power divided by the area. Now what's that area? Area is going to be the total area that the wave is going through. If I'm one meter away, um, the light wave is going through all the area of a sphere that surrounds that light bulb, isn't it? Imagine it like a, I have a little light bulb here. There's light coming out in all directions. So you use the area of the So would you use the area of a circle? Or of a sphere? Of a sphere. Okay. Anyone remember what the area of a sphere is? You meant one third? Or no, that's so <laughs> All right, but yeah, it's uh, <coughs> So the area of the sphere, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm looking at it. Oh, you already know. Yeah. <laughs> it's at four thirds. Well, you asked four pi, not four thirds. Four thirds would be the four thirds pi r cubed is the volume. Volume. Four pi r squared is the area of the sphere. Now, if the light bulb, the, the light bulb we treat as being at the center of the sphere, over here, the area is. Um, It'd uh, be four pi. The R would be one. What, what's the radius? Yeah. One, one meter. So right. four pi. <gasps> that would be four pi meters squared. Good. Okay. So what's the intensity? out here. So it'd be a hundred over yeah, hundred over hundred watts over four pi meter squared. Right. Good. And what's that equal to? Twenty five. Oh yeah, twenty five. Twenty five pi. 25 over 5. What is 7.95. Good. Watch per meter squared. All right. See how you got that? Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's do something more interesting. By the way, if I went twice as far away from this light bulb, So let's say that instead of this, I have two meters here. How would the intensity have changed? They would what I call that the intensity of one meter. It would go less. It would go less, right? Mm -hmm. But how much less? Mm -hmm. Twice. I don't know. 
Okay. Four times. Oh, well, yeah, with this. Four times. The power would stay the same, right? Okay. But this thing would change by the R would go from one meter to two meters. So you go from one meter squared to four meters squared. So I at two meters, <coughs> divide this by an extra four, right? Mm -hmm. So about two. See how that, that goes? If I was four meters away, how much would it be? Eight times the length. One, one fourth of that, right? Mm -hmm. So as I go away from the light source, the intensity drops by the square of the distance that I'm away from it. It's inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So if I double my distance, I get I, the intensity of light goes down by one fourth. Okay. Well, this is kind of interesting. So, let me just give you something that's kind of. This is that. This will be one more intensity, and then we'll. We'll do maybe one more thing after this, but let's see if you can get this one work in a group. So, if I have a sun and a earth over here, what's the distance between the sun and the earth? Anyone remember? I think it's in the back. I think there's an appendix in the What's that? It's like 93 million miles away. What's that? Like 93 million miles away. Physical constants. Somebody look, would somebody mind looking that one up? I forgot to yeah. 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 Okay, Earth. But I did write this thing. If I'm on Earth and I'm looking at the sun so it's directly overhead, the intensity of sunlight. It's a uh, one forty nine point six billion meters. Which one? <laughs> you got one hundred and forty nine point six billion meters. Forty nine point six times ten to the nine meters. Yep. So it's eight light minutes away. How much is a how, uh, so three hundred million? How many sec times eight? What's 300 million times 480? 300 million? Yeah, what's 300 million times 480? One point four four times 10 to the 11. Okay, that's, that's, that's pretty close to that. Okay. Okay. That, that sounds good then. Okay, so the intensity of the sunlight at the Earth is 1,300 watts per meter. What's the power output of the sun?
took some water with black food dye and we put it in direct sunlight pointing direct, so that the surface of it and then put it in something that was clear and we could put the surface of it was pointing directly at the sun. And we could do some stuff, corrections for latitude and things like that. Going through atmosphere stuff like that. Anyway, you see the rate at which that water heats up. The known volume of water, you know how much light is being absorbed per time. And uh, no, I black, that, right? pretty much all of it's being absorbed. So, yeah. so there are various other ways. I mean, that's that's kind of a, not the most precise method, but that is a method. Uh, with solar panels, mm -hmm. you know how much you know your efficiency of the solar panel. Yep. You know you, you know say it's 10% efficient. Uh, you point it directly at the sun. You have one meter. You get the wattage of that coming out, and then you would know watt per meter. Per meter, per meter. yep. You know, multiply by ten. So a whole bunch of things you could do. Yeah. All right. One other thing I'd like to um, I'd like to indicate. Uh, oh, by the way. So one more thing. What is intensity of light? surface of the sun. Question mark. So what's the radius of the sun? You have your little sun fact thing that you're looking at? Oh. Radius of the sun? Yeah. But is the power directly coming from the radius itself? It is. So if I'm, so I have the sun radiating power in all directions, right? Mm -hmm. And I look at the power out here, the same amount of, of energy, total power, is going through even a little sphere <coughs> right around the sun, right? So if I look at the surface of the sun, I just make this sphere just that, that all the power is going through at the very surface of the sun. So what was the radius of the sun? Um, 695.7 million meters. 695 times 10 to the KPD. Oh, 695 times 10 to the 8 meters of okay. Um, go ahead and see what the, meanwhile, how did we get to this? Um, this is just, since power over area is intensity, so intensity far. times area is power. We'll just take 1300 watts times 4 pi times uh, this thing squared. Plug in numbers. Get, yeah. Uh, see, go ahead and see what the intensity of light is at the radius of the sun. 
So we do you use the power Wait, that don't we got we use the already? Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty Point. sure that this is much more correct. Really? Yes. So did you take this power? Yeah, and divided it by the area after I found 4 pi times the radius. Okay, 4 pi times the radius. Radius squared. Yeah. And then I divided it by the Oh, shoot. Gotcha. So you took this as... <laughs> 3.6 times 10 to the 12 watts. Yeah, I think that's 6.0. Divided by 4 times 6 billion 297. 6.02 times 10 to the 7. Yeah. Squared. Yeah, 6.02 times 10 to the 7. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, 6.02 times 10 to the 7. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so what? I just did a little bit. 6.02. All right. Well, let's see who got it. Who got this number? Well, if we can do a quick estimate. This is 16 squared, so we got to the 7, 10 to the 7 over here. 10 to the 26 divided by 10 to the 17, about 10 to the 9. Another 10, about 78, about 78, good. Okay, that's reasonable. Okay, so why am I interested in that? Well, it turns out that if you go over to K-State, they have a laser there called the McDonald laser. And uh, this laser comes from a little cube about that big of, of uh, completely co covered in like doers and doers of liquid nitrogen, maybe even liquid helium, I don't know, to cool it. And the laser itself, this little lazing cubic centimeter um, device, um, the laser that beam that comes from that, they have a whole room full of stuff to try and control it a little bit. Anyway, the intensity in that laser beam is a trillion times more intense than this. So just to give you a sense of what's going on, the pulse width of that laser beam, the length of the little pulse of the wave the, in time, the, the, the time it takes for that pulse, laser pulse to go uh, uh, past you is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. In that time, one joule of energy gets put into that. So the wattage of this laser is one joule divided by 10 to the minus 15 or seconds, which is about 10 to the 15 watts, right? So during the time of that pulse, the power of that laser is more powerful than all the power plants on Earth put together. Okay? Jesus. And uh, but it's very, very short. Now, all of that energy gets put into a dot, all that about, with a, with a uh, uh, diameter of about a millimeter. So.